Earthbound was an aberration of a game that failed miserably both critically and commercially upon its mid-90s release, and the tagline, this game stinks, is probably the reason why. Fittingly, Nintendo decided to re-release it on an equally ill-fated console nearly 20 years later. Despite, or possibly because of all this, the game has a sizable cult following and it also gained positive critical reception after its re-release on the Wii U. But you know, there were plenty of beloved RPGs on the Super Nintendo, what makes this one so special? Well, it's quite possibly the first video game I've ever beaten single-handedly, and as you might expect, it's incredibly special to me. By saying that, I am admitting that nostalgia is at play here, but I'll try to overcome that and judge it as fairly as I can. With that said, let's get started, starting from when you boot up the game, shall we? Good ol' pre-title screen sequence, nothing like getting me hyped to play a game like showing UFOs causing mass destruction upon a city. After the title screen, there's an attract mode that shows you some of the places and events that happen throughout the game. The inference that there are probably more places like these and the desire to visit them all eventually really motivates you to play the game. Anyways, in a similar manner to other RPGs, you're allowed to select the color of the box borders, with your option ranging from plain to mint, strawberry, or banana. Gives a whole new meaning to the term flavor text, I'd say. You also predictably you start by naming the four main characters, and you even get to name your pet, favorite food, and favorite thing. But let's not beat around the bush any further. You're here for the game itself, aren't you? Wow. From the moment the game starts, it stands out with a unique setting, eschewing or subverting the common fantasy tropes often associated with the RPG genre. For example, Ona, the settlement shown in the introduction, is a typical 90s town with a hotel, drugstore, arcade, and all that. Our story begins in the year 1990X, when a young boy named Ness, or again, whatever you decided to name him, awakens from the nearby impact of a meteor. When he tries to approach said meteor, though, the police have blocked it off and are being pestered by the annoying next-door neighbor, Pokey Minch. What, were you expecting to be the person to notice a mysterious object crash near your house from out of nowhere? Too bad! The police have to get involved with everything. In all seriousness, later that night, Pokey rudely awakens you with the news that his brother Picky went to see the meteor and hasn't come back yet, so Ness, his dog King, and Pokey set out to rescue him. Before you do though, Ness's dad calls to remind you that he'll be there to save your progress. He must be dreadfully busy if he's not even home in the middle of the night, or at any point later in the game. This is where you finally get to the JRPG experience. When you try to reach the meteor again, the police blockade is down. Maybe they were chased off by all the hostile dogs and snakes that suddenly appeared. Hope you got the cracked bat that was in your sister's bedroom so you can fend them off. The dogs and snakes, not the, not the police. The battle system presents itself as traditional but effective, with you having to attack groups of enemies until they go down, or become tame as the text says, by way of your weaponry, items, and magic, uh, I mean PSI, just like any RPG, making it relatively easy to get into for anyone familiar with the genre. I mean, let's be real, the PSI is a substitute for magic. The first one you get here is life up, which is the typical HP increase. It's immediately useful since your health is just gonna keep going down without it as you encounter enemies, unless those cookies that you sometimes obtain are enough. Once you reach Picky, King chickens out and an alien bug named Buzz Buzz descends onto the meteor. He tells you of the devastation 10 years into the future caused by the cosmic destroyer Gigas, that's, that's the right way to pronounce it and you can't convince me otherwise, and a prophecy see that Ness, along with three other children, are the only ones who can stop the fiend. I love how Buzz Buzz's speech presents itself as the stereotypical you're the chosen one speech and how afterwards Pokey is like, ooh, now you gone done it, Ness. It's also pretty neat how the speech gives a brief explanation as to why you're fighting the foes that you do. Gigas' influence is actually affecting the present day, warping the minds of many people and animals towards violent tendencies. Before you're able to return the Minch brothers to their parents, however, you're blocked off by Starman Jr., the first boss fight. Quite frankly, it's no challenge, but I feel like that's the point. Throughout the fight, Buzz Buzz proves to be such a heavy hitter and grants you psychic barriers. It really makes you think, wow, will I eventually get to do that? And serves as a motivator for you to play so you get stronger, sort of like Zero saving your skin in Mega Man X. This is one thing I really like about Earthbound, it keeps making the player want to progress through the story. Tantalizing hints about events that happen later in the story are constantly being shown to you while not necessarily being shoved down your throat. There is passing by a boss or dungeon in sections of the game you revisit later, there is dialogue from NPCs that foreshadow later events, there are immediate goals that need to be fulfilled, and all of these motivate you to keep going. Not only is there motivation to see what's next, but it's also fortunately rarely unclear what you need to do to progress thanks to things that NPCs tell you and access to a map from very early on in the game. If all else fails, then you can talk to the hint guy who appears in the towns and, of course, gives you hints on where you're meant to go next. For a fee, of course. 
The protection that Buzz Buzz provides is unfortunately short-lived as he is crushed flat by Pokey's mom as soon as you return. Before his death, Buzz Buzz tasks Ness with recording the melodies of the 8 Your Sanctuary locations and with this you're given an overarching quest to partake in. Much of the game involves you doing much smaller tasks to help you advance to these locations but I won't try to be as detailed with them as I've been with the intro. Anyways, what you're ultimately doing in Earthbound is at the baseline much the same as any other RPG, traversing across the world, defeating enemies along the way, and subsequently gaining experience points and leveling up your party members' stats. Immediately worth noting is that the game ditches the random encounter system that some other RPGs employ. While enemies still appear unpredictably, they actually show up on the overworld before you battle them. Even though it's ultimately still difficult to avoid some enemy encounters due to how fast the idiots move, I actually think this makes the encounters far less grading by default. You're able to mentally prepare for each enemy before you run into them, and if you're lucky enough to get behind the enemy, you might even be able to strike first in battle. You'll have to be careful to not have the same happen to you, though. Another nuance is that if you encounter an enemy who can't stand a chance against you, you'll win automatically, which makes gaining extra EXP less tedious. It's a really nice touch. The first major step of the journey is dealing with the Southern Nonet gang known as the Sharks, who are much tougher than the snakes and crows you encountered near home. Their leader, Frank, is so tough that you might end up losing to him a couple of times, if not to his backup Frankenstein Mark II machine. Fortunately, it doesn't seem like you truly die, you just have to give it another shot. What this means is that even if you lose a battle, when you retry the last save point, you still retain all the EXP you had earned up to that point where you lost. In many instances, this leads you to having a higher level and thus a much better chance when you come up to the boss again, which is highly appreciated. With that said, losing a battle is not totally inconsequential. Since nobody besides Brick Road thinks to put a phone in their dungeon, you'll still have to retread a lot of old ground if you lose to a boss fight at the the end of one. When you restart, you'll have zero PP and half the money you had on you. That last part sounds harsher than it actually is. Despite having probably beaten plenty of rowdy animals going to and from the meteor, you might have noticed that you still only have zero dollars on you, and if you've played any other RPG, that might come off as a bit strange. That's because unlike most JRPGs, you don't gain money directly from the enemies you fight, which in a way actually makes more sense. Instead, your father will deposit money into your bank account. Later into the game, the amount of money dear old dad gives you is honestly ridiculous. Don't tell Mr. Minch. Most hotels and drugstores, which are where you'll probably do 90% of your money exchanging, have an ATM that you can use to withdraw money from your bank account. As much as I'll give the game credit for making this money handling system relatively convenient, it nonetheless seems a bit unnecessary. There is not much difference between having money on hand and having money in the bank aside from a bunch of withdrawing and depositing. Later on in the game, withdrawing money actually has a fee but that fee being exactly the same amount as your withdrawal is a little excessive. Maybe if there were withdrawal fees throughout the game, just much lower, the ATM system would have felt more worthwhile. Anyways, after beating Frank and his machine, and after learning of the mayor's graphic imagination, you can finally get access to the road to the giant step. I should probably touch on how Earthbound handles the design of its dungeons, or whatever you want to call these. The dungeon design of Earthbound is rather basic, with not much in the way of advanced puzzles. There is one instance where Later on, where you have to use the bubble monkey to drop down a rope from a ledge, and perhaps a couple instances where you have to guess the correct route, but that's about it. In terms of layouts, the dungeon design tends to be a straight shot to the end, with some rooms containing chests, or presents, or garbage cans, or even coffins. They do shake things up on occasion, the deep darkness having a dangerous deep water and even magic truffles found using the piggy nose, but these are few and far between. While I would have liked much more in the way of dungeon elements unique to each locale, I nonetheless don't think the current setup is bad by any means. The layouts are relatively easy to navigate and much shorter than I thought they were before I revisited this game, and I rarely found myself wandering aimlessly within these places, which is nice. It's mostly a matter of side nooks and crannies that house presents with useful items. After beating the giant ant at the end of the tunnel, you reach the giant step, the first of the eight your sanctuary locations. They're all very tranquil places where Ness has a flashback to his infanthood and where you restore your health and status. The music that plays here, remixed from Earthbound Beginnings, just makes you want to chill in these places for a good minute. Ah. Once you reach the Your Sanctuary location, all the enemies in the preceding dungeon will run away from you as you leave, making them easy to sneak up on. I often did this while leaving the dungeon to get some free EXP. 
Once you've taken on the Onet police force, you can access Tucson, the second major town in the game. While the buildings look largely the same as Onet, there are some distinct landmarks such as the park with people sewing stuff and the Pole Star Preschool. The music is also very different from Onet, and this one is such a joy to listen to. Anyways, the talk of this town is a young lady named Paula, who telepathically tells you that she's in danger at any time you decide to rest. Another instance of the game giving you a clear goal to fulfill. How do you get to her? Well, try talking to the Apple Kid and Orange Kid. Now these are a pair of memorable characters. Orange Kid has a better reputation amongst the townsfolk, but the only invention he lends you is completely useless and breaks quickly. His rival, Apple Kid, meanwhile, has something that helps you out on the very next step of the journey, a machine that erases pencil-shaped objects. What? Uh, why would a machine like that ever be useful? Oh, after traversing the peaceful Rest Valley, which does not live up to its name at all with some pretty difficult enemies to fight, you reach the Happy Happy Village where the town is being painted blue by the Happy Happiest cult led by Mr. Carpainter and... Pokey? Yeah, he was promoted to being the high priest of the cult, and when Carpainter is defeated, the kid even fakes wanting to be your friend again. What a guy. Anyways, once the cult is dismantled, you free Paula and she joins the adventure. Her skill set in battle varies a bit from Ness's. She starts at a much lower level than Ness, which makes her more frail, although it's so darn gratifying watching her level up so much from enemies that Ness makes quick work of. Besides that, whereas Ness has mostly supportive PSI, with his offensive moves being primarily status effects for the special PSI Rockin, or forces, because I love forces so much that I can't stop thinking about it. All those PSI abilities have a greater emphasis on offense. PSI Fire deals damage to a row of enemies, freeze to one enemy, and thunder to randomly selected enemies. She also has the ability to pray, which has random effects on the battle at hand, from light healing to intrusive status effects. This move is therefore a bit of a gamble. Now would probably be a good time to talk about the battle system as a whole. For the most part, if you've played any RPG from this era, you probably have a decent idea what to expect, although there are a couple of aspects to set it apart. For one thing, there's an auto-fight function that can make some fights less tedious. Personally, I never used it because the battles already have a fast pace and don't require too many button presses. Perhaps the most innovative feature of this battle system is the scrolling HP system. In most JRPGs, whenever you get hit by an enemy, your HP automatically drops by however much damage was inflicted, but in Earthbound, it drops gradually, meaning that you can recover from hits that should otherwise be fatal. I have heard criticism aimed towards how useless it is early on in the game since you have a lower HP count leading to your HP fully draining way quicker than later on. While I would agree that it becomes more noticeable the further you progress, it has saved my skin as early as the battle against Captain Strong, so it's not like it's totally inconsequential in the first half of the game. I think another facet that makes battles in this game even more enjoyable is the presentational aspect. A lot of what happens has a good weight to it, it satisfies getting a smash hit and watching the screen flash as the enemy takes heavy damage and it's devastating to get critically hit due to how hard the screen shakes and how the text becomes red if one of your party members is knocked out. The backgrounds are pretty weird but also diverse and a fairly good technical showing of the Super Nintendo's graphical capabilities. Another neat thing about this game's battles is the fact that there are multiple battle themes depending on what type of enemy you're up against. In most RPGs before and after, there is only one theme that plays for nearly every encounter in the game, and another that plays for nearly every boss encounter. But this game has multiple themes for the enemies and bosses. Even with the high quantity of battle music, it's no slouch in terms of quality, since many of these themes are iconic and really catchy. After heading back to Tucson, you're granted a drive to Threed, a place infested with zombies and other Halloween-like bad guys. Haunted figures are in the graveyard, in the streets, in the hotel... Oops. Now Ness and Paula are stuck in this room with no way out. Look what you've done. <laughs> Paula then reaches out telepathically to a boy living in a boarding school in the northern country of Winters. This next section of the game has you playing as said third party member, Jeff, alone. Well, he has a monkey with him, but still. 
Unlike Ness and Paula, Jeff doesn't have any psychic abilities. Instead, his high intellect means that he'll be doing the majority of the item handling. His most common tools are the bottle rockets you can buy, but throughout the game he also spends nights fixing up broken gizmos to make additional tools. Staying up way too late at night doing nerdy stuff, now that's relatable. My personal favorite of these utensils is the Shield Killer, which, as the name suggests, disables enemy shields, but he can also manufacture stronger weapons for himself, defense sprays, slime generators, and more. He is also able to spy on the enemy to determine their PSI weaknesses, which came in plenty handy for me. The journey Jeff takes is where the game starts to feel like a globetrotting quest. The Bubble Monkey helps you find the foe Loch Ness Monster Tessie and make your way to Stonehenge. While the towns you've been to so far have looked similar on a base level with some differences, the places you go to from here on out look more and more diverse. You go to bigger cities with skyscrapers, an Egypt-like town complete with ancient pyramids, a portside village, and even more. The distinction between each locale helps to make this game really memorable and makes the world feel fleshed out. There are even some other things that play a part in that. For example, when you wake up in a hotel, a guy will read you the local newspaper with the headline changing depending on where you are in the story. The Earthbound Player's Guide even gives the population and typical weather of each major location. It's really interesting stuff. Jeff eventually meets up with his dad, Dr. Andonuts, the greatest scientific genius in the world. He loans Jeff the Skyrunner, and it flies over the later locations, Forside and the Dusty Dunes Desert. Once again, there's a sense of intrigue and a desire to visit those locations eventually. The Skyrunner crashes into the location of Ness and Paula, and with additional help from another one of Apple Kid's wacky inventions, you can access a path behind the Threed Graveyard. The long path eventually leads to Saturn Valley, a town filled with the people known as Mr. Saturn who... Well, I think the footage just does a better job explaining them than words ever could. Some of their kind are being kidnapped and enslaved in a factory behind Grapefruit Falls. The mastermind behind this is Master Belch, a sentient pile of vomit commanding several other sentient piles of vomit. The boss fight against him is pretty straightforward. Earlier, you got a jar of fly honey, and if you give some to Master Belch, he spends the whole battle scarfing it down. Just wail on him while he does so, and victory is yours. A pretty odd concept for a boss fight, although Master Belch is only the tip of this iceberg. The enemies and bosses are quite varied in gameplay and design. Trees and floating spheres will combust upon defeat, making the scrolling HP mechanic especially useful. Why Wild animals will try to bite or even poison you, Octobots try to steal your stuff in the middle of the battle, Ghost of Starman immediately begins the battle with PSI Starstorm, forcing you to use a psychic shield as soon as possible. Not too fond of that last one. While there are plenty of enemy encounters that can be brute forced, there are also times where you'll need to strategically use PSI, but not overuse it in case you reach a boss later. The bosses also follow suit in terms of creative design. There's giant moles that all claim to be the third strongest in their group of five, a clumsy robot that's taken out with the help of a band known as the Runaway Five, a fiery dog that turns into diamond partway through the battle, and so much more. Soon after escaping from Belch's factory, you can take a coffee break with one of the Mr. Saturns, where you reflect on the journey up to this point. All the stuff I've described up to this point I went through quickly, and that's because there's a lot of bizarre stuff that happens throughout the course of the game, some of which I glossed over in the plot summary. You get a band out of debt so that you can get to Threed because the boring music of their bus is the only thing that deters the ghosts. You wander through a big crowd of insane cultists struggling to get to the other end of a room. You encounter a man who wishes to become the first hybrid between man and dungeon. You repeatedly get your picture taken by a man in a top hat, etc. With this coffee break though, along with a tea break later into the game, you're reminded that even through all the zany dialogue and weird scenarios, this game is still a legitimate journey at heart. That's one thing I admire about this game. Quirky lines are in abundance. I've been playing Earthbound lately, I'm having a tough time. I'm a talking rock, but the rocks around here don't talk too much. Broken down old submarine. The yellow color is purely coincidental. And I get my kicks out of lines like these, but they don't come at the cost of the game feeling like an adventure. I've already addressed the worldwide theming, but you also meet plenty of memorable characters and stand against multiple cosmic level threats, some of which actually have blood coming out of their mouth. You know, for kids. When I saw the coffee speech this playthrough, I felt a real personal connection when it said, you must keep your sense of humor, work through the tough situations, and enjoy yourself. I know that sounds kind of corny, but I'm impressed by how much Earthbound pulled at my emotions, even on my third playthrough. With the zombie infestation completely resolved, you can make your way through the desert and get to Foresight. Wait, 
Oh, we're at Tucson three to four. Oh, clever naming scheme. Although it isn't really used from here on out. Right off the bat, I love the music of this place. While the horn noises in Tucson were low and subdued, the music in Foresight has many brass instruments playing at the same time, signifying that this city is larger than anyone before it. Anyways, up to this point your first instinct when entering a new town has been to head to the nearest store to buy goodies such as weapons, but when you get to the department store on Foresight, the result is a bit weird. Yeah, you're not allowed in at first. Later on, you can enter the department store, but then you realize the reason it was shut down to begin with, as Paula is kidnapped from you by some weird alien guy. On your way to try and get her back, you reach Moonside, and if you thought the game did some weird stuff up to this point, you haven't seen anything yet. It's a bizarre parallel dimension of Foresight, where yes is no and vice is versa, where men in Hawaiian shirts warp you from place to place, and you have to bring an invisible guy to this other guy. This is all just hallucinations caused by the Manny Manny statue, previously seen in Car Painter's possession. Upon destroying it, you get a call from Apple Kid saying that he invented a yogurt machine that he shipped under low priority. So low priority that the Escargo Express just left it in some cave in the desert. This finally leads you to explore the Monkey Cave, which was perhaps my least favorite part of my whole recording session. Why? Well, it primarily consists of giving the right items to the right monkeys. This doesn't sound particularly offensive at first, but this game's inventory management is far from optimal. Each party member has a maximum of 16 inventory slots, which isn't too bad, but key items like the ATM card and soundstone are included in that, as are the armor and weapons you have equipped. Worse yet is that items can't stack at all, meaning that every single darn croissant you have takes up its own inventory slot. This leads to plenty of situations throughout the game where you have too much stuff to carry, and you can bet that this happened plenty of times in this cave. I mean, a lot of the things they ask for are in these chests right here. Just get them yourselves, you stubborn primates. Now, the game does at least give you some options to mitigate this issue. Nessa's little sister actually works part-time for the Escargo Express, which is some serious dedication for a girl her age. And by giving the company a call, they can send out a delivery guy who can store up to three of your items for a fee of $18. But say you don't want to spend money or are fine with the item being gone forever. I mean, you could just drop or use it, but why do that when there's a much better option? See, this one guy in Tucson has nothing to sell but his for sale sign. And should you decide to buy it, you have the ability to pawn off your items from anywhere. And by anywhere, I mean darned near everywhere. Even in a pyramid in the middle of the desert spotted with murderous hieroglyphs, you will be found! Man, I love this game. After clearing the part that exposes the needlessly complicated side of the game, you get an ability that actually makes things simpler for you. PSI Teleport, which allows you to instantly warp to any town you've been to by running far enough in a straight line. With that caveat, you'll have to find an optimal place to start up your teleport, which isn't a huge deal considering most of the towns you've been to so far have long stretches of road. If not, then it is possible to turn part way through the animation if you're feeling daring. You also get the yogurt machine, which allows you to access the upper floors of Montnatoli building. There you regroup with Paula and get to the next town, Summers, by helicopter. Or maybe not. Instead, you use the repaired Skyrunner from 3 to reach Summers. There you meet a woman who specializes in making magic cakes. They sure are magical, right? This introduces us to the fourth and final party member, Prince Pooh of Dalam. After intense moo training where his appendages are ripped off, absolute trooper this guy is, he is deemed worthy to join Ness on his quest. I've talked about how Ness's PSI prioritizes healing and status effects while Paula has largely offensive PSI maneuvers, who meanwhile has a bit of both being able to utilize life up, healing, freeze, thunder, and brain shock. He'll have even more powerful offense later in the game. He also has a mirror ability that allows you to transform into an enemy, gaining their abilities but causing the player to lose control of him. I've used this ability plenty of times in the past but only successfully used it once amongst all the footage I recorded for this review. A lot of the time it ends up failing. Oh well, it's totally optional at the very least, and skilled players could probably find good use out of it. Besides, he can also use Teleport Beta, which allows you to teleport without having to move in a line. 
While the battle system does a good deal to make the characters feel unique from each other, I nonetheless wish the playable characters stood out more in the story. I'm fine with Ness being a mute, especially since his character gets time to shine later on, but the others don't stand out much in terms of dialogue despite all of them having a few lines over the course of the game. That alone isn't a huge issue, since many games without dialogue can convey a character's personality through other means such as animations. However, I wouldn't say Earthbound does this to a high degree either. Most animations throughout the game use a minimal amount of frames and don't really convey much personality from the characters. The graphics overall feel a bit primitive in certain areas. A lot of the enemies share the same sprites in the overworlds, even when they are decidedly a different breed of bad guy, and the overworlds themselves can feel pretty flat. That's not to say that the game looks bad per se. The use of color is overall pretty solid, the enemy sprites are decently detailed in battle, and the environments are still convincing. The buildings mostly look straight and smooth while the cliffs and caves are rough and uneven, as they should be. I just feel like outside the battle backgrounds, the system's capabilities aren't being used to their full potential, and even despite this, the game has an unfortunate tendency to slow down on the overworld when there are too many sprites on screen. Not unfounded for the Super Nintendo, just something I noticed. Let's get back to Pooh joining you in Summers. While I ragged on the monkey's cave earlier, I think from here on the game gets better. Enemies are quite challenging and engaging to take on, the locations you visit get more interesting, and you don't linger in one place for too long. It's a little shameful that Pooh has to leave your party for a bit since he must be taught the way of PSI Starstorm. Oh well, at least you can beat a couple of the sanctuaries with him. While he's away, you meet the first man dungeon hybrid, Dungeon Man, which proved to be an interesting section of the game to say the least. I'm glad Brick Road could finally live his dream. He helps you you reach the deep darkness wherein Pooh rejoins you having learned the Star Storm. You soon reach the Tenda Village and all the people here are so shy that they're barely willing to talk to you. As a result, they're not very useful right now. But once you leave, you hear that Apple Kid does have something useful for you in Winters. Unfortunately, something seems to have gone awry on his end. Upon this third visit to Winters, things have gotten much dicier for those living there, with aliens and robots all over the place. This is probably the point in the game where Gigas' toadies start to feel like they have greater presence. This place wasn't always infested with woolly shamblers, but now it is. At the heart of the operation is the base underneath Stonehenge, which is one of the hardest and longest dungeons in the game. Beginning with the purple cave section, and eventually getting more mechanical with much tougher enemies and all these creepy green tubes with people that Giga's forces have kidnapped, including Apple Kid and Dr. Andonuts. The Starman Deluxe at the end can really give you a lot of trouble, but if you can conquer it, Apple Kid tells you where the Book of Overcoming Shyness is. By letting the Tenta tribe become more extroverted, you can open up the paths leading to the Lost Thunderworld and the final two sanctuaries. With all the melodies recorded, we reach the end game. This might take me a little while. Up until now, Ness has gotten brief flashes from his youth every time he visits one of the Your Sanctuary locations, but now he gets a full flashback from when he was still a baby. It's a very touching moment where Ness's parents express their hopes for their child. After that, you end up in Magicant, the realm of Ness's mind. While I vented my mild disappointment with the characters' personalities rarely coming to the forefront in this game, I applaud Magic Ant's ability to give us a glimpse of Ness's thoughts and feelings. This zombie is still humbled by Ness's victory, Pokey seems to actually want to be friends, and Buzz Buzz will forever be remembered. At least in Ness's mind. The final section of Magic Ant is a literal flex. You thought it was impressive for a team of four kids to defeat the Kraken? Well, at this point, Ness alone can bring several Krakens to ruin. However, he has to face an even greater threat than them, his own inner demons. Ness's Nightmare has many of the same abilities as you, including PSI Rockin, Life Up, and Flash. The last one makes the battle kind of unfair since it has the capability of knocking you out instantly. Not ideal with a one-member party. It didn't happen to me in this recording session, but I'm still pretty sure it can happen. But if you can defeat it, Ness will be filled with the power of the eight sanctuaries and finally be able to truly fulfill his destiny. This moment is simply exhilarating. This kid who just took down multiple Krakens becomes much, much stronger, even learning the power of Teleport Beta, and the music does a perfect job supporting this growth. After Ness wakes up, you return to Saturn Valley to perform the first test of the Phase Disorder, a machine that's supposed to link two points in space and time, and has been hinted at quite often throughout the game from as early as when you first meet Dr. Andonuts. Unfortunately, after all this build-up, the machine fails. According to the Doctor, it can only be completed using a piece of meteorite. Now, that's just ridiculous. Who could just happen to know where a recent meteorite landing would be? It's from here on out that the game slowly gets darker and darker, 
Gigas' troops have taken over Oda, and this feels even more pronounced than it did in Winters. Everyone in town is too scared to let you into any of the buildings aside from your own house, the color palette is no longer bright and sunny, some absolutely brutal enemies are thrown your way, and the haunting music from the Stonehenge base is brought back. This is only the beginning of what will happen if Gigas succeeds. I don't know about you, but it seems to me like things are heating up. Once you grab a piece of the meteorite, the phase disorder can be completed. At last, you're able to reach that one cave in the Lost Underworld, resulting in a point of no return. To reach Gigas, however, you also have to travel many years into the past, which cannot be done with your human bodies. How Dr. Andonuts figured this out, I can only imagine. With this in mind, the only option is to become robots. Quite frankly, the whole you must travel to the past point doesn't feel well thought out considering what happens later, but I won't linger on it. When you reach the past, it's completely bleak and lifeless, and unlike anything you had seen in the game up to this point. Going forth to finally face Gigas is a haunting task, but you can't turn back now. The enemies are of course the hardest you've faced yet, putting the machines in peaceful rest valley to complete and utter shame. After reaching a crack in the wall, you finally enter the bowels of Gigas' lair. Quite literally, it legitimately looks like the path is made of intestine. Ew. When you get to the center, what looks like Ness's face emerges from the machine, and then... Pokey? Yeah, it seems that sometime between when he hijacked the helicopter in Foresight and now, he became Gigas' right-hand man, or maybe he was with Gigas the whole time? By the way, the game has dropped breadcrumbs hinting towards Pokey's fate and actions after he stole the helicopter, so I wouldn't say this plot twist comes out of nowhere. The final boss is honestly fairly easy if you know what to do. In the first phase, you have to focus your efforts on Pokey while putting up PSI shield so that Gigas' PSI rockin doesn't affect you. Once you've worn down Pokey for long enough, he disables the Devil's Machine, which reveals Gigas' true form. Actually, it barely is a form, or even a mind. He just keeps throwing incomprehensible speech and attacks at you. Partway through the battle, Pokey taunts Ness, telling him to call out to his mommy. In fact, that's exactly what you have to do to finish this battle. Get Paula to pray and call out to the people across the world you met on your journey, which we can see gets further and further with every person who prays for Ness's safety. This culminates in the player praying for Ness and his friends, having apparently never met them. This last straw breaks the camel's back, causing Pokey to retreat and Gigas to dissipate until... What the hell? The game turned off somehow! With Gigas defeated, Ness's journey is finally over. The souls of the party return to their original bodies, who returns to Dalam, Jeff decides to stay with his father, and you get to escort Paula home. Either hers or Ness's. With Gigas' psychic influence gone, there are also no more enemies to get in your way either. Once Ness has returned home, the cast of characters scrolls by and the credits roll. Phew. What an ending that was. Not every game where the annoying next door neighbor becomes defeated Sakates, the embodiment of evil itself. Speaking of which, in a post credit scene, Piggy delivers a letter from Pokey saying, Come and get me, loser, spankity, spankity, spankity. But that's a story for another time. Honestly, when I decided to revisit this game for this review, I was somewhat worried that my nostalgia would blow up in my face since I try to have more of a critical eye than I did five years ago. And to an extent, this game's problems are more apparent to me now that I have more experience with RPGs. I would never seriously call this game perfect or appealing to everyone, not in a hundred years. The inventory management is honestly lousy, the graphics and dungeon design are pretty basic even for the time, and the money handling system feels a bit unnecessary. When when I was playing through it though, none of that could really prevent me from enjoying it. I didn't spend hours wondering where to go next, it was challenging but always manageable, and it wasn't slow or monotonous. In fact, I blew through the majority of this game in less than a week, a feat I never imagined I would be capable of just because I wanted to keep playing it, and I don't imagine that this will be the last time I revisit it. The game has its large cult following and fanbase simply because there is so much to love about it. It has enjoyable combat, systems that alleviate tedium, memorable locations and characters, funny and charming dialogue, a very nice soundtrack, and constant motivation to keep moving forward. Simply put, even with the issues I've brought up, I still think this is a great video game, and one of my favorites ever, even after all this time. Even after I've played plenty more RPGs, most of which don't have the problems that this game has, I would rather play Earthbound than nearly any of them. There really aren't many others quite like this one. Well, maybe one, but again, that's a story for another time.